I have another little ramble. This one is inspired by the sheer boredom that you sometimes have to put up with in the dangerous farming for different types of materials, and the constant drive to find ways to increase the efficiency of a given grind. So here I am at one of the crystal sites, in support of the most efficient grind for raw materials possible, chipping little shards of crystals off of bigger shards of crystals, and generally just kind of farting around while I listen to my favorite podcasts to try to pass the time. And this highlights one of the little issues that I have with Elite Dangerous, is that in its quest for realism, it asks you to make a bunch of interesting little sacrifices that for the most part the player base is willing to put up with. But then in service of those sacrifices, the game often denies you some of the quality of life improvements that would make these types of grinds a lot more tolerable. So, as a part of my ramble, I'm, I'm going to cover a bunch of different little things that I wish Elite would do, a bunch of things that it is currently doing, and ways that ways that I think those two can be balanced. Materials grinding is probably one of the least engaging components of gameplay in Elite, for a couple of reasons. The first is... The overall amount of time that they ask you to spend trying to find the little parts and things that you need to get engineering blueprints and actually it's not even just engineering blueprints really. There is an entire gameplay loop built in or built around collecting synthesis materials. These are a lot of the same materials that you use for engineering blueprints but which incidentally can also be used to load different types of weapons with more powerful versions of ammunition. There's a lot of um, synthesis for Guardians, for example, you'll find the AXI guys will sometimes quest after because these things will give you a 30% bonus to your raw damage output. But in exchange for that bonus, you have to spend a bunch of time farming, thankfully, some grade 1 and 2 materials that aren't too hard to come by but still involve some time investment in order to manage. Limpets are pretty easy, although a very resource-intensive um, synthesis blueprint that a lot of explorers will lean on to keep their cargo holds light until they need a limit for a specific task. Usually, hull repair, occasionally fuel transfer if you happen to be a fuel rat. But some of these blueprints can get really burdensome. If you've seen my shock cannon video, let's see if I can find that blueprint down here. Um, here it is. The shock cannon blueprint is almost exclusively manufactured material. The problem with this being that um, the only place you can get manufactured materials is ship-to-ship -ship combat or a couple of specific surface sites that you find on planets, places like Dav's Hope. This is a very expensive blueprint too. So in addition to being short on ammo, shot cannons are really intensive on the synthesis that you need in order to make them work. Now I don't have a problem with the synthesis loop per se, except that you can get um, let's see, some of the demands that these blueprints require of you in part um, for example you could get an engineering blueprint pretty easy out of some of these materials and an engineering blueprint is permanent it doesn't go away once you apply it to a module it's with that module until you choose to get rid of it The way the game is weighted, though, um, if you look at material rarities, all the materials in the game are listed as being of a certain quality, with grade 5 being the rarest in a given field. Materials traders allow you to exchange one material for another, but if you try to exchange up or across to different categories of materials, you're going to take a 6 to 1 hit, meaning that you need 6 of a particular material in order to exchange across or up. And that throws the emphasis that the system requires of you completely away from farming for grade one, two, or three materials individually and puts it almost exclusively on grades four and five. Five being the absolute peak of efficiency. Thus, I sit here in a crystal shard field a couple thousand light years from the bubble. Going after grade fives with the express intention of then going to a materials trader and 
trading down for the other materials that I might need. While this is incredibly atmospheric, I gotta give the dev team at Elite Dangerous a lot of, of brownie points for the sound design that Elite Dangerous provides because it's incredibly good. This is treading the line between scary, lonely, and immersive. And if I had a VR headset, I'm sure that this would be absolutely flipping and incredible for about an hour. And that's my problem, is that even though I consider this gameplay to be... Even though I consider this environment to be well thought out, the gameplay doesn't keep me engaged with it, and I very quickly find myself running YouTube on an extra monitor, not really caring at all about the finer details of the environment. Occasionally stopping to respect the scenery, but for the most part just grinding out something that I'm not, I don't really have any fun doing. There are a couple of ways Elite Dangerous could probably address this issue. I just don't know if that's a priority for them right now. One of the ways that you can do this is to provide me a means to automate it. Perhaps by setting up a mining post or depositing a drone somewhere on the surface that can go hunt for materials while I go off and do something else. And then I have to come back and retrieve the materials that the drone collects at a specific time or at specific intervals so that I'm not wasting the drone's resources and perhaps even return to collect the drone. That keeps you from having to invest heavily in boring gameplay that makes you want to stop playing after a little while. If it weren't for my podcasts, if it weren't for YouTube, if it weren't for Netflix, hell, if it weren't for Hulu letting me watch basically all of South Park while I'm doing this over the course of several weeks, then I I don't think I'd be able to muster up the intellectual will to do the kinds of things that I'm doing right now. And that's bad, because it really is, it's kind of a condemnation of the gameplay in general. Because the, the best games in the world, I don't feel any desire to do this. Like if I put on Destiny 2 and I play Crucible, I, I can't even listen to my Hulu, or not, I can't even listen to my Amazon music page. I am absolutely committed to what I am doing, absolutely invested in what's going on, and, and connected with the game in a way that I rarely ever find that Elite Dangerous drives me to connect. The only times I feel like I need to put my tunes away, turn off my podcasts, and, and focus on when I'm PvP, CQC, or occasionally when I go into a high-intensity combat zone and I'm using a build that demands me to actively manage my pips. And that's it. I mean, has reses. Sometimes I mute the game entirely and I just fly around and blow anything up that has a wanted sign. I don't even really care what the bounty values are. I just tune out. And a while back, I just I realized that that it's not the kind of gameplay I'm after. But that seems to be a lot of what Elite Dangerous offers, especially in trade and exploration. Exploration is a role that is basically life-supported by people's ability to turn on podcasts. I don't know a single explorer who just listens to the game while they explore. They all get to a point, especially on longer excursions, where they tune out the scenery, put on ED Discover or some other assisted tool, and just scan high value bodies as they move through a system. And there are some guys who enjoy the completionist element of scanning every body, even if it's just a little 500 credit ice ball floating around in the outer rim of the system. That's a, the exploration thing is, there's a longer conversation that can be had about it, but what I want to focus on is, is the idea of what it means to grind in a game. Because to me, grinding is a curse word. When you admit, like, when, especially when developers use the vocabulary, they want their players to grind for a particular weapon or a particular material. What it, it's basically a tacit admission that they know that their gameplay loops are boring and monotonous, and they're just trying to goad players into engaging with a system that is not rewarding enough to be engaged with on its own. For my case in point, I like to cite Halo as a good example of what, what games used to aspire towards. Because Halo 2 and Halo 3 didn't really have a progression system that involved game rewards that altered gameplay. You had a couple of cosmetic armor items. In Halo 3, I think there were 
eight or nine, some of which involved like hunting for specific types of achievements. But you, you didn't really have to grind for a particular weapon that affected gameplay. Everybody started a match pretty much equal, and the only thing that really defined or separated characters was player skill. That's one of the problems that I think Destiny has, has tried to balance, is that Destiny, the things that you're quote-unquote grinding for are fundamentally gameplay-altering in nature. Whatever the particular weapon or meta item is, an armor or, uh, or some mod or some object, and because it's RNG-based, you, you don't get to really set goals around it, especially for some of the older grinds, people used to try to go for custom rolls of, Red of Redrix's Claymore, which isn't available right now in game, but that was one of the sought after pulses back in the day, meaning a couple years ago. And because the game would never. Until the specific quest for Redrix's Claymore came out, the only thing you could do was just grind for a particular god roller. If you weren't happy with what the quest item gave you, the only thing that was left was to grind, quote unquote, for a god roll. And that meant playing Crucible, doing specific activities, optimizing gameplay, gearing yourself for what is effectively just playing until the game randomly decides to give you the thing that you want. And, and that's actually part of the reason why I'm playing Elite Dangerous right now. The, the grind in Destiny started to bug me more than doing this, because at least when I'm doing this, I can listen to my podcasts, I can listen to all of my other activities. If I try to grind in Crucible for a particular role of a weapon or a particular item, it just eventually it pisses me off because I can't I can't describe an amount of time to anything in Destiny, especially when it comes to random roles. So one of the things that I absolutely loathe doing in Destiny right now is grinding for Ascendant Shards to upgrade armor. Because it takes forever to find a crew that's actually good enough to run the Nightfalls at a high enough level to get Ascendant Shards. And then once you do, it's not always a guarantee that you'll be able to get the Ascendant Shards unless you're farming at Grand Master. Because there's always a chance that you'll roll under and you'll get a couple of Enhancement Prisms and maybe an Exotic. What you need are the Shards. So you end up playing a bunch of Nightfalls in a row, getting bored with them really quickly because the game's not giving you what you want, and not being able to, to really focus on exactly what it is. Put it this way. If I want to go out and get an Ascendant Shard in Destiny, I have no idea, in functional terms, how much time it will actually take me to go and get that Ascendant Shard. I might, get, I might be lucky and get it on my first 30-minute Nightfall run, but I've had a couple of nights where I've chained these things together and just haven't rolled the RNG that I wanted, spent an hour trying to get the Ascendant Shard and just get a bunch of prisms that, you know, I could trade up with the gunsmith to get an Ascendant Shard, but it's not predictable. And some nights I'll, I'll try to grind in and I don't even get enough Ascendant or enough Enhancement Prisms to do that. And it just wears you down. Where in Elite, especially when you use sites like this, there's not a lot of RNG in it know exactly what you're getting and I can come up with reasonably accurate figures for how much time it will take for me to get a particular item. It's just that this is less engaging than Destiny. I mean there's there's a lot of skill in learning to drive an SRV but once you get it down um, there's not all that much to it. I mean what you're seeing right now is if you've ever gone material grind it's all that you get. It's all that there is to it. And the thing is, it's like, I'm not... FDEV is phenomenal at constructing simulation-based games. It's one of their principal market segments. You got Planet Coaster, Planet Zoo. You go back farther in time, you get some of the tycoon games that they were involved in. They know how to do business sims. They know how to play with resource management. They know how to do all of these things. And aside from credits and materials, I don't... I don't really see the same the same resource management elements. It's not as deep as, as it is in their other games. And it would seem to me that you could get players a lot more engaged with materials farming if you had other tools that could take some of the boredom out and let me focus on the things that I want to do. Because when I sit down and play Elite most nights, the thing that I want to do more than anything else is combat. 
all other tasks that I perform in the game are ancillary to or in support of combat, which is the least rewarding in, in physical terms in the game of any of the roles that you can fulfill. And the other thing, too, is that the combat zones don't they're just little beacon areas that are never near anything important in the system that I guess are supposed to represent some form of strategic significance, but it feels kind of arbitrary. Kind of weightless, like, oh, this battle's taking place over here in orbit of a planet, but not near any resource that you would think would be valuable to the planet, like, for example, a space station, or on the planet's surface, one of the many surface installations that would represent some production capacity, some material value that an invading force or a, an interested army might want. And, and that's kind of a missed opportunity for me, because I, I think that if I'm a merchant and I see that a system along one of my trade routes goes to war, that would scare me, because you don't go driving a semi-truck full of Xboxes through war-torn Kuwait. Like, like, that doesn't happen, and when, a, when the countries go to war, it has a direct economic impact on the system, and it should drive merchants and traders away. They should want to avoid those types of places, but if you drop into any of these systems, the, the game's RNG just generates NPCs of all different kinds of classes, and you end up with a bunch of merchant ships that don't make sense to be there, that would be highly vulnerable, especially if they're going to a starport controlled by an enemy force. They would be a ripe target. So even if I'm a commander and I want to run a trade route into one of these systems, it should weigh on me. It should be something that gets flashed in my face as a direct kind of big red alert. Hey, this system's at war. You might want to evaluate the risks and rewards. And in parallel to that, me running cargo into a war zone should automatically mean that that cargo is worth more, that I should get more revenue accepting that risk to my ship, but the Elite doesn't do a good job at counting these things, and it, it... You know, it's one of a number of big missed opportunities that make the gameplay less engaging, less impactful. That, that we can't at least partially damage stations and outposts in service of, of a war in a system also kind of bugs me, because it... In a way, it makes combat zones a lot like materials gathering. You're just flying to a spot and doing a thing, and you know, waiting for the numbers to hit a right level. And then, when they do, the zone disappears, or your reason for being there is gone, and you just move on to the next thing. And that's ultimately what causes me to stop playing Elite for certain periods of time. Even though I still enjoy it, it just I find myself taking breaks from it more often than I used to. I'm optimistic about the Odyssey update, I actually really hope that it turns into something big. I keep hearing from my circle of, of individuals within the community that that FDev is, like, that this isn't just going to be another token update. This isn't going to be a fleet carrier's bolt-on or an exploration bolt-on that breaks a whole bunch of systems. That this is potentially a fundamental reconstruction of the game's code. And I would be super excited if that turns out to be true because it might represent a change in tone and atmosphere within Elite that, that would be beneficial for the future. Because, and, and this is, I'll throw this out here, I know that there were people in the community who will find this controversial, but I think that, that if Elite doesn't get its act together soon, that Star Citizen, the 10-year slow burn project, is eventually going to reach a point where it starts cannibalizing the dangerous players. And I think after have knows it. The whole Odyssey trailer feels tailor-made to me to address the looming Star Citizen juggernaut. Because as a business perspective, remember, you've got to be thinking, if you're a CEO of a company, you're thinking at least five years ahead. You're evaluating what your competition's doing, and you're not considering them where they are now, you're considering where they could be five years in the future. And five years in the future, Star Citizen is going to be out. Even in their most pessimistic projections, they're looking at a feature complete release sometime between now and 2025. With the roadmap leaning more towards 2023-2024. And, and FDEV is... Not only are they aware of this juggernaut, I think they're, they're proactively attempting to address it by courting members of the Star Citizen and No Man's Sky communities 
in their closed Odyssey betas. I just heard on Elite Week today that uh, Morphologist, Architect Reviews Guy in the Star Citizen community, has been NDA'd into Elite Dangerous's closed Odyssey beta. And that, I, that's a really smart move, because taking people away from that community, or at least garnering input from that community on things that Elite Dangerous wants to do, or needs to do to be competitive, it's, just, it's like common sense to me. Especially because David Braben and others in the community have alluded to Elite Dangerous ships, all of them, being designed around their interiors. So having an actual architect come in and give input on the interior designs, which I think are going to be part of Odyssey, especially if Morphologist is involved. So, anyway. Um, back to what I was talking about before. I very strongly feel that one of the things Elite Dangerous needs to address is boredom in gameplay. And one of the things that it can do is by giving players specific tools to limit that boredom by placing a greater emphasis on advanced planning. I think that having a deployable drone that you can drop off on a planet's surface to mine for resources for you, while you go off and do other things, is a really cool idea because that drone then becomes an asset that you have in the wind. And you have to give consideration to what that asset's doing and maintenance for it, and when it's filled up, you have to go out and get it. I think it'd be even cooler if these deployable drones could potentially be discovered and raided by other players for their supplies. That's one solution. The other solution is, especially with exploration and long route plot plotting, give us an autopilot. Uh, the Super Cruise Assist is basically a gimped autopilot that attempts to address the same problem, but without the gusto to actually appeal to players the way that it should be. And for me, I, I don't like trading. I think it's boring. I only do it to fund my fleet carrier and raise credits to buy a, and do ship builds. I don't care about trading. I, I could understand making players do manual trading initially, but at some point, especially with fleet carriers, let me hire that out. The fleet carriers represent an incredible opportunity to incorporate what, what amounts to a business set. Like, like, let me do fleet carrier world. Let me set my fleet carrier up as an actual trading post where I can hire a fleet of NPC ships and how even maybe design and outfit those NPC ships and then send those NPCs out to accomplish specific tasks for me. I actually would love it if if I had an array of ships that I could deploy from my fleet carrier to accomplish a particular task, especially if I had to consider financing them and taking care of payments and everything, so that when I drop into a system, if I'm trying to target for a, specific, a particular resource, let's say I've got a bunch of gold missions that I want to fulfill, or I want to collect a whole bunch of gold because I've realized that the market's really low in this system and really high in another system, let me deploy an army of NPCs, a small one, maybe you know, maybe limit it to, to six or eight initially and just kind of see how it goes. And then let me equip those NPCs to, to be able to go to a station on my behalf, buy parts and supplies for me, bring them back to my carrier and start loading it up. And, and maybe make it expensive to do that. Like have there be costs that get imparted on them. You have to finance these NPC ships, you have to train their crews, you have to outfit them, you have to pick the initial ships, you have to and you have to be careful about it and then make it so that those NPC ships can, are vulnerable to other players like they can be raided they could be targets for piracy for example so that I have to then worry about escorts and going through the effort to put together and assemble escorts and hell I mean like, I think it would be phenomenal if I as a commander could hire one or two NPC escorts even if it's just from a station and they come pre out that would follow me around and protect me the way that a ship launched fighter does that follow me into super cruise, drop out with me, that, could, that I could just pay to follow me around and help protect me. Because that, that, that's a mitigating deterrent that can increase the scale of individual confrontations, require a lot more planning in advance. Like, and there are so many opportunities in Elite Dangerous that just get missed because you know, I'm not even sure why. These things seem like no-brainers, and the NPCs, while they're not anywhere close to the competence of a full human pilot, 
are at least enough of a threat when they're in good outfit ships to, to be something that could at least deter a ganking encounter. That would make the ganker have to think it out a lot more. Anyway, that's my ramble. If I keep going, it's probably just going to get boring, so I'll go ahead and call it a night. If you do manage to get to the end, uh, thanks for your time.